Welcome back to chapters 9 and 10, and I'm recording this one specifically for the honors class as we discuss your rendering assignment, um, which will be a little different than the regular theater classes. Um, so let's dig right in. One of my favorite things about theater is the costumes. I loved playing dress up as a little kid. My sister and I, and my mom said she wouldn't even bother to get us dressed in the morning because we were going to be playing in our dress up clothes when we were, you know, of preschool age. So part of my love of the theater was the sort of enchantment with costumes and, you know, putting on something fun and who it made you feel like you could become. And this is to me one of those times that I want to tie in theater to your real life, right? Um, and I don't mean to say that if you can't abort, uh, afford the best clothes, that you can't be your best person, but wear things that um, you feel confident in, that give you, um, that show your personality, because what you're wearing does affect you right? And it affects the way people see you. And I know that may sound a little superficial. And um, I know a lot of millennials sort of uh, resist that idea that you are what you wear. And I think that there's some wisdom to that. Um, but particularly when you're going into a situation, um, a professional situation, please take the time to think about what you're wearing. And don't let what you're wearing be more interesting than you are. <laughs> it's going to be kind of a harsh way to say it. Um, you know, I, I spoke with my sister-in-law the other day, and she was talking about she is an architect, and she has an intern who came in uh, mom jeans, which are very on trend right now. And I tried to assure her of that. But she just, you know, said, you know, but we're, she's coming to an architect office. You can't wear jeans. You know, that was her main thing. And so, you know, I know that places like Google, you can dress down, but think about the situation you're going into. And, um, you know, how does that cost you make you feel? How does what you're wearing, um, how does it affect your psychology? You know, on a day that you want to feel confident, consider wearing hard-soled shoes. Uh, whether for men, that might mean dress shoes that are leather. For women, that can be, it doesn't have to be high heels, it can be flats. But if it has that little extra click in it, if it makes you feel confident, um, you know, there's uh, a new Dixie's Chick song about... Um, put on your best shoes and strut around, you know, <laughs> and I think that there is some wisdom um, to the psychology of what we put on our bodies, whether we're, we're wearing it societally to fit in, where we're dressing for success, whether we're dressing um, for comfort. There's a lot of reasons we wear what we wear, and we can identify a lot about a character based on the way that the costumer dresses them. So I included um, in your information about how to write your first paper, I included some pictures of Hamilton in different outfits and how he evolved over time. It could be reflected in the clothes that he was wearing. Um, this is when I costumed The Wiz at Hattiesburg High School, and I had the pleasure of costuming um, Chelsea, who is um, the character in the tutu and the tights. And that was very similar to what Chelsea would wear in everyday life. She had a really fun and funky sensibility. Now, obviously, the character playing Dorothy, she has to wear that gingham right? In The Wiz and The Wizard of Oz, she has to be wearing blue gingham. <laughs> it's just like mandatory in my mind's eye. But I had a little freedom with this witch character. I didn't want to put her in a pointy hat. I didn't want to put her in, you know, traditional witch costume. And Chelsea already had this fun, funky, punk sensibility that I thought would be a great direction to take the character. So sometimes as a costumer, you can use the existing style of the actor to inform. You know, I don't think it's any coincidence that all of Johnny Depp's characters have guy liner, you know, because they're taking his initial sensibility as an actor, carrying it over into his character. You know, people like Bob Mackey have costume designed for Cher for her entire career, and he knows what she likes to wear. He knows um, who she is and reflects that in her clothes. So costume indicates status. So when we're looking at Hamilton, when we're looking at Sound of Music, there are times when the Von Trapps wear their military garb, 
right? When um, Captain Von Trapp wears his military garb and he's using that status, using all the medals on his chest as a sort of status symbol. This is a picture from Wicked, which is another reincarnation of the Wizard of Oz story. And that military, um, you know, all of those military regalia indicate status. And, you know, especially if we look at later in history, you know, um, deep military history, you know, you could be, you could have serious consequences for impersonating um, someone outside of your class or rank, you know, in Shakespeare's time, if you were of a certain class or rank, you couldn't wear certain colors. Um, this has always been a way for people to distinguish their social status is through um, through their clothes. So, you know, if, and it's interesting, some people are so outside of the social connections that they don't even notice the symbology that people are trying to send. You know, some of you ladies might have red-soled dress shoes, and other women look at that and they say, oh, are those Blonix? Are you, are you wearing a designer shoe? Right? And um, the key demographic that lady might be trying to impress could be a man who doesn't even know that red-soled shoes are an indicator of status, right? Um, so uh, often the status uh, costume attire of an entire historical period can be marked by what the king is wearing or the queen. The monarch of the time sets the style, sets the trends, and other people quickly follow. So of course in our communication age, we look at things like Vogue magazine, it gets pushed up and amped into overdrive, um, this idea of fashion or style. But in the back in the day, it was still these uh, tastemakers existed and um, set the styles and status of the time. <laughs> this is a particularly mean website called Low Budget Beasts. So... As designers, we have these ideas about what um, costumes we can create, but we have to work within our budget, right? So um, when we, we have a responsibility as designers, when we pick our plays and we work with our director to pick the plays, we need to make sure that we have the budget to represent that play well, right? Uh, in recently, I picked Little Shop of Horrors. We didn't get to produce it because it got shut down by the coronavirus. But um, Little Shop of Horrors was a very ambitious play. Just like they have Low Budget Beasts, they also have a whole website uh, devoted to Low Budget Audrey, which if you're not familiar with the play, there's a man-eating plant that comes in. And luckily, we were able to rent a plant um, from Murfreesboro. But and we were at risk of being on one of these god-awful websites because of limited funds, because of my limited woodworking abilities. I can sew all day long, but when you ask me to build something out of wood, we we have limitations, let's be honest. So um, part of being a good designer is knowing your strengths, knowing your budget, working creatively, or you know, not choosing a season or not working with a season that doesn't have the budget to support the kind of play that you want. I'm on a play finding committee at South Jackson and Tullahoma, which is a community theater. And part of the big question that we look at when we pick a season is, okay, if we're going to do um, assassins in the fall, well, that's just uh, a low budget Sondheim, you know, they're just wearing everyday clothes, then we can afford to do Little Mermaid in the summer, which is elaborate costumes that cost lots and lots of money. So can you rent it? Can you creatively get around it? If not, don't produce it. There's me and what we lovingly think of as the sweatshop when I was in grad school. Um, so there are different roles for different people in a shop, uh, just like if you have a job in fast food, you know, you have the shift manager, you have the fry guy, the cooks in the back, you have the people working the till in the front. Uh, if you walk into a costume shop, different people have different skill sets. I, when I worked professionally, was just a stitcher, 
right? Um, although I did design professionally as well, but I mostly was stitching. I was behind a machine, um, following a pattern, doing as I was told. These are sort of, you know, if you're on a construction site, I was the one with a hammer in my hand. I was not the contractor. <laughs> Drapers are, um, are technicians who pattern. So they're experts on how fabric drapes. Um, so if I'm going to build a suit, for example, and, um, you know, I will have to have worked with tweed a lot to be able to match the plaids to make sure they align correctly. I need to know um, fiber contents, how much stretch it has as to how it will lay on my body. Um, if you have never had clothes tailored to you. I really recommend it. If you're going to invest in a good suit, if you're going to invest in professional wear, um, anywhere where you can get your pants hemmed, such as uh, a dry cleaner in a metropolis area, you know, consider having them drape your whole suit because if it fits better, it's going to look a hundred times better. Even if it's just a top from Old Navy or a dress from Old Navy, if they can tailor it to your body type, make sure the hem is correct. Make sure that it's um, tapered at the right place on your waist to accentuate your waist. It is going to look so much more flattering than if it's bought off the shelf to fit a certain size. Now, there's an exception to that. If your body type is exactly like the mannequin, you don't have to worry about that. But hardly any of us are. And I costume lots of you people, so I know. Everybody's bodies are weird, right? People always come in and they say, one leg is longer than the other, right? They already know this weird thing as to how clothes will fit them wrong. So drapers make everybody look good and they're, they're good at their job. And sometimes that means creating patterns. Sometimes that means fitting and pinning uh, to make sure that the actor looks like a thousand bucks. And that's one of my favorite things about working in costumes too is because it's couture. It's to every individual. Then we have the shop supervisor who uh, makes sure we all stay on task. <laughs> and then the designer. Now let me say um, that designers are not always present. Uh, if you're working in a professional, you know, if you're working at Theater Memphis, you may have a designer phoning in the design from New York City, right? They've, uh, they're hired as a designer, but they're working remotely. So you don't always have a designer on hand. Now for me as a theater designer, costume designer, I'm the one designing it. I'm the one stitching it. And then I drape it and fit it, right? I'm my own supervisor. So in a small shop, you know, obviously there isn't this much distinguished. And it's worth saying, I have a picture of Backstage Badger here because it is totally worth saying that your title, even in professional settings, does not keep you um, from having to hot glue vines during tech just because you're hired as a draper you know there are moments when everything is all hands on deck so if you know if i'm hired as an actor technician in a summer stock show during the summer i could be sitting at the sewing machine one minute and then i could be up running the spotlight uh, if it's in rep you know on the third production so we all come together to get the work done and that's part of the theater lifestyle is that you just you have to humble yourself and be in service to the goal to the final production the element so you don't always have to sew and you know do things couture by hand you can um, pull from your own inventory at the moore county campus we have quite the stock of costumes uh, quite the stock of silly hats. We keep them on hand for all our silly hat needs. Uh, and we can pull things from our own stock. And I've slowly been building up, for example, our pirate costumes because we do so many children's plays. Uh, we have a pretty good stock of animal costumes because we do so many children's plays. Sometimes we have to build things from scratch, especially when we're dealing with um, a weird show like Little Shop of Horrors where you have, you know, three uh, characters who dress and match a lot you know we're gonna have to build those three 1960 dresses or else buy them off amazon and so they all match um, because when you have three different size actors and you know but they're supposed to be part of an ensemble you want them to match so uh, if i had all the time and money i would definitely build all the costumes because it's definitely an art form and it's fun so 
Um, just continuing this conversation about The Wizard of Oz. This is a production we did at the Motlow Moore County campus uh, when I first arrived at Motlow, what, some nine odd years ago. Uh, that painted backdrop there is of the spooky woods. You may remember the moment in The Wizard of Oz when the Tin Man uh, is attacked by flying monkeys. So, um, and this is tech, forgive their lack of makeup. It was, it was a technical run. They didn't have to wear makeup that day. So um, I did help with the costumes for this production when I first came to Motlow. And we, uh, along with the director, I helped design this outfit. You can see here that I had more purples in mind, but when it came to fun and the readily available fabric at Joanne, she found a beautiful blue that I think looks great. So I'm very happy with what Vicki Young did in referring to uh, the final patterns that she was able to find in the fabric. Now, when you create your rendering from the character you wrote a character analysis over, notice that I'm not necessarily doing realistic drawing here. You do not have to be a uh, flawless artist. You have to communicate your ideas. That's the goal here, right? I didn't have to... Um, get every contour of her nose right because the nose is not part of the conversation. Um, so I included, you know, I really like How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I think that's a wacky and charming, endearing influence for this character. So you, you have ideas and you kind of jot them in the margins. And not everybody does it this way, but um, I think it's a useful sort of way to communicate to your technicians, and I've seen it modeled a lot in the professional world. So you can see we got that neck ruffle carried over from here, the neck ruffle, and then she had the same ruffle on the bottom that the um, director decided to have the munchkins walk on their knees in the end. And so the custom built dress was very useful because it was, you know, extremely different from how it would have been if you bought it off the shelf. So you can see we had the question here, do we have to sew on the polka dots or do we need to iron them on? So those sorts of questions that you're talking about in, um, in, the, in the costuming lab. So Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite stories. It's called The Great uh, American Fairy Tale. So we have the Grimm's Brothers, who a lot of these Disney movies are based on the Grimm's Brothers' original stories that they wrote down, these folk tales. Uh, not that the Grimm's Brothers created them, but they took the time to record these German, Danish, uh, French stories. And um, they are marked by, these folk tale fairy tales are marked by um, these larger-than-life sort of um, imaginings. They're often to warn children um, and they are part of the reflection of the culture, which is one of the goals for this class. It's for us to sit back and say, how does this piece of art, what does it tell us about our culture? So that's kind of why I wanted to take a break today to talk about The Wizard of Oz because it reflects on our sensibilities as Americans that it is our unique folktale. So there's a um, theory, which I think is pretty substantiated by this point, that when Baum sat down to write this story, he was writing a political allegory, right? He was trying to enforce a gold standard. He wanted, um, he didn't want the U.S. banks to print more money than we had in gold reserve. Uh, and so that is a complex political um, agenda that he had, but it's uh, he was trying to simplify it through political allegory. Baum owned a uh, general store, and he would talk to the children when they came in and tell them these stories, and it was sort of his fun way to pass the time as a store owner. So, um, in this political allegory, we have the politicians who are represented by a lion, and that's very uh, traditional allegory that the lion represents the government. We have a scarecrow who represents the farming community and um, the way that they were sort of blindly following uh, whatever the American government was putting before them. We have the Tin Man. Of course, he represents industry or business world. Uh, he's heartless. He's... Uh, without compassion or feeling. Dorothy represents 
are every American, right? And then, of course, the different witches represent the different political powers in the different areas of the United States. So there's the Wicked Witch of the West. Of course, she has a vested interest in the gold standard because she owns all the gold, right? She's sort of our villain. Um, and uh, the silver shoes that Dorothy would have worn in the original novel were meant to represent the way that Baum thought we should have gone, which was silver. Spoiler alert, we went with a gold standard. We don't really have a gold standard anymore. We, we print more money than we have in gold reserves. We've done away with that system for what it's worth. So um, the ounce, right, we're going to Oz. That ounce is abbreviated OZ. So that's kind of where that name of Oz and the green comes from. So when you're costuming the Wizard of Oz, you kind of have to sit down and say, how much historical accuracy do we want to include in this fantasy world, right? Um, that witch, Wicked Witch of the West hat that's become iconic from the film, well, everybody was wearing that. And if you look at Baum's um, renderings in his play, uh, in his uh, novel, the the munchkins are even wearing those pointy hats because they were just popular in the 1800s. That style of, of pilgrim hat was when I was uh, helping to costume outdoor drama. A lot of the Native Americans actually wore turbans, right, in Ohio where this um, story was set. So, you know, you have that decision. Do you put dark skinned people in turbans at the risk of confusing your audience member? Because when they see a turban, they think of the Middle East. Um, and we ultimately decided not to go with turbans, even though they were historically accurate. So, you know, you can get ideas from the history books, but especially if you're trying to sell a romance or a melodrama, something you're trying to endear your audience, you don't want to alienate them too much with fashions that aren't currently fashionable, if that makes sense. So you can kind of combine the fashions of today with the fashions of that historical era to make something that people feel confident and fashionable wearing. I think that's part of the reason I love Shakespeare plays, but I have never put someone in an Elizabethan collar, right? Because they're uncomfortable, they're impractical, and even though they're historically accurate, they're not cute. I <laughs> don't put a lot of men in leggings um, because they're revealing. A lot of men don't feel comfortable just wearing leggings, even though that's what people wore back in Shakespeare's time. So you have this sort of balance between historical accuracy and uh, what is cute nowadays. So I say that to say, if you're going to come up with a dress for Liesel from the Von Trapp family, feel free to pick a dress that you think is pretty from a magazine of you know, the current times um, that they could have feasibly worn in the 1940s. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go to a play with someone and they may walk away saying, well, those hemlines weren't realistic. People in the 40s wore their dresses all the way down to their calves. That may be true, but your current fashion designer, uh, costume designer, is going to work with the fashions of the day and what's available off the shelf, right? When we go to buy those dresses, we may have to buy a hemline that's only available, you know, that's currently available at Target because it's just what's easier. So it can be kind of a mashup of current fashion and uh, historical accuracy. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but you may find inspiration from looking at historical images. So obviously when a lot of you think of The Wizard of Oz, you're thinking of that 1939 musical. It deviated a lot from Baum's book. Baum's book was a mo much more like Grimm's. There was some pretty heavy and dark times that, that the Wizard of Oz musical version is much more campy and fun and a visual spectacle, but not quite as dark as Baum's book was initially. So when we're talking about the great American musical, it's worth mentioning that everybody in this movie is white right? But we know that America is much more diverse than that. So once we went through the civil rights movement, we have this new movie, The Wiz, which is taking the great American musical and making it uh, fit the historical, uh, the cultural heritage of people of color, right? These black people wanted the American fairy tale told their way. Man, I love The Wiz. It's such a beautiful story. Um, it's a little bit hard for me to watch Michael Jackson now that there's so much out about his life and what he possibly did to small boys. So um, 
that element of it is always sort of uh, mixed for me and hard stomach, but it's just a beautiful piece of art. And every time it comes to Nashville, every time it's advertised, I always try to get out and see the whiz because the music is just makes me cry. It has so much soul to the music of it. So much um, beautiful, poetic, um, meaningful, um, heartwarming for me. So let's talk about the differences, because I think it's a good representation of how you can have a high concept, right? You can take a story and make it modern. It's kind of the same way, say, Hamilton did, right? He took a story that was historical and made it his own, right? He took it into the new context. He took it for Black people, for people of color, for, um, you know, he himself as a Latin person, you know, he's making it his own. So there's precedent to that. So in the original Wizard of Oz, in Baum's book, there was a tornado. Well, a lot of people of color don't live in the Midwest. So the Harlem snowstorm was the way that the Wiz took it, right, where they said it, because snowstorms happen in big cities like Harlem. There's not going to be any tornadoes in Kansas. So he's kind of changing the events. <laughs> in the original 1939 movie, we have that infamous lollipop guild. And you saw the picture from the rendering. Uh, that, of course, is sort of culturally insensitive When we get, by the time we get to the 70s. We're no longer monetizing little people and their experience um, can feel very culturally insensitive. So he changes that to hoodlums on the street. And they're, um, you know, doing backflips and dancing in the streets and having fun. And it's much more... Um, easy to portray without sort of the issue um, of abusing little people or perpetuating, um, you know, the, the term munchkin or this idea that can be problematic. So in the original Wizard of Oz, there was a woodsman, but, you know, we don't have a lot of woodsmans nowadays. They're not, it's not a, not something your guidance counselor is going to encourage you to go pursue and hand you an axe. It's a very old-fashioned vocation. So um, in the Wiz, we have circus equipment that gets abandoned. And in the county fair style, you know, they leave and this piece of circus equipment, this old tin piece of circus equipment is left behind. And that's a really fun update to an arcane vocation. So in the original Wizard of Oz, there was a definite um, reference to drugs, to opium, because opium was the drug of the time, and poppies are, an, are what you use in making opium, right? The poppy flower. So when, when Dorothy falls asleep in a field of poppies, that's meant to be a drug reference. But because not a lot of people are talking about opium these days, you know, they're taking opioids as a... A finished product in a pillbox. They're no longer, you know, um, smoking it or in direct contact with it. So they kind of changed that to the red light district. And um, if you've ever been uh, to a big city, you know, there's kind of a bad part of town where you can buy drugs. Uh, or, you know, prostitutes are also referenced in the Wiz version. So once again, just taking that modern drug reference and making it accessible to a modern audience. And the original monkeys, you saw the one the picture I showed earlier of the monkey with the fez hat. Well, that was actually a tin toy that would bang its symbol. So it was a reference people understood when Baum wrote his book, when the 1949 musical came out. But it's not one that modern audiences are familiar with, that the Wicked Witch of the West would have this toy uh, these toys that would sort of go out and attack. So they changed it to motorcycles, which is a really fun visual um, because you get all the leather and you get sort of this spooky rock and roll sensibility that was really uh, um, terrifying if you've ever seen The Wiz when you were little, you know. So we look at these stories that we tell about ourselves, and I think it's really important, the work that Hamilton is doing, the work that The Wiz is doing, which is making sure that these stories that are supposedly great and American are accessible to everybody. 
So I could talk about costumes forever, <laughs> and I know I, I did last lecture as well, so I'll go ahead and move on. Um, but I hope this is one of these times when uh, what we're talking about is pertinent to your everyday life. Uh, you know, uh, what you wear affects your personality. What you wear evokes symbology for other people. You may be sending messages. Never buy, you know, a shirt that has a symbol on it that you don't understand right? It could be misunderstood as racist. It could be misunderstood. It could represent a band that you've never listened to. So um, know that symbols matter and they're hugely and deeply ingrained in our psychology. And so when we visually represent ourselves, please make sure that you're doing that well, um, especially in a professional environment, uh, because it could be a, a way that you can be misunderstood and you don't want to be misunderstood. Um, all right. So Makeup is definitely an extension of costumes. Sometimes it's the same designer who designs the makeup and hair as the um, costume. So there's three basic types that I'm just going to touch on briefly with makeup and we're not going to spend too long. But the main purpose for most of people putting on makeup is a simple beauty makeup, right? They're putting on makeup to enhance their physical beauty, right? This goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Persians, um, ancient Grecians all have record of wearing lots of makeup. Some of it was deadly. If we look at arsenic, some of those other ingredients killed people, right? Even going up into Shakespeare's day, they were still using arsenic ingredients that we know would have slowly poisoned or uh, added to the infant mortality rate, unfortunately. So there was a price to that beauty. Um, but a lot of people, if you're in a straight play, if you're in a regular play, they're going to ask you to wear makeup just to enhance your beauty, just to cover up flaws and create a clean complexion. So then we have character creation, such as the Tin Man. Um, a lot of character creation is going to involve latex pieces. So you can see his chin there. I've added a latex piece that you can buy at any costume store. Uh, which is that chin piece. And that's held on with spirit gum, which is an adhesive that's pretty harsh, but pretty reliable if you're looking for like a Halloween um, latex uh, piece to stay on. You know, if it stays on the whole show, uh, you, you can bet they're using spirit gum. Fake mustaches, that kind of thing, in most cases, is going to be held on with spirit gum. You have to be really careful, careful with what adhesives you use on people's face because they can be very abrasive, cause rashes, especially if you're in a long run of a show. You really need to be thinking about what adhesives you're going to use to keep on latex pieces because um, they can do some serious damage. I included this picture because you don't always want a character to look beautiful. So we do have that beauty makeup for a lot of people, but if it's the villain, you may not want them to be pretty, right? If you've got Maria showing up to the Von Trapps for the first time in the ugliest dress they've ever seen, maybe she's got dirt all over her face. That's not going to make her pretty, but it's going to tell the story. And um, this actress, actually, I had trouble getting her to wear makeup this ugly. I wanted to do her eyebrows more like a person in drag. She didn't want to do that. Um, but it's always, when you're a designer, you have to work with your actors and make sure they feel confident. That's part of your job. Uh, this is Madagascar, which we did recently at Motlow. Um, you can see that some of the makeup was more realistic. Our um, actress who played Alex, if you're familiar with the Madagascar story, just like the DreamWorks musical, um, she had on, you know, a cat face there, you know, just like... Uh, what you would maybe see, uh, here we have another cat face. Now, these three actors were double cast, so they didn't have the luxury of wearing cat makeup, but they wore the ears, so that's more kind of traditional. But we had with the lemurs, ah, we had with the lemurs these fun glasses, and part of that was the lemurs are not only um, these actors, I mean, these characters that are representing a certain breed of animal, but they're also sort of these fun, quirky, weird characters. So just like we might give a nerd big, ugly glasses to indicate their quirkiness, King Julian definitely deserves some funky glasses to help tell the story that they're sort of all of these oddballs, right, which can be really fun. Um so you can see in Madagascar, we start in New York City and then we move to the jungle. So that's why we have kind of two basic backdrops, uh, which 
one of the things that kind of makes me cringe is that we did not get the psych that straight. You can see all these ugly shadows. <laughs> it's hard for me to look at. So if we look at Asian cultures, and we'll talk about this more when we get into theater history, there's an entire symbology around the makeup. You know, when a certain color makeup is presented on stage, it's meant to represent the good guy, the bad guy. Uh, you know, you see a certain makeup in Kabuki and you know, okay, that person is a demon um, just based on the patterns of their makeup, which I'm not a big anime fan, but my anime students tell me that it's often reflected in... Um, in anime culture so uh red a lot of westerners are going to look at that and see the devil but the red is actually the color of heroes as is yellow in kabuki uh theater but we'll talk about that more when we get into japanese theater so there's kim kardashian she did not come up with contouring um a lot of bigger spaces if you're performing you know at bridgestone arena in nashville you have to contour because your face will end up looking blank and weird from a distance i don't know if you've ever been at a concert where they have close-ups on the cam you know on the screens and you see how much makeup these performers have on and that is because your face tends to disappear so if you're in a play and they're asking for a beauty makeup and there's more than 500 seats in the house they're expecting you to contour even the men because they want to see those facial expressions they want those to be highlighted highlighted and that is um, an important element to telling the story is seeing those facial expressions so yeah moving on to lighting um lighting is something that's always been an issue in the theater of course historically we look back at the ancient grecians and they had their plays outside and so the plays were written if it was a trilogy when the the play starts it's sun up right and so in those first moments of aeschylus's agamemnon we have um a a guard up on a roof watching the sunrise, right? And then at the end of the plays, all three plays, we have a sunset. And that's because they watched theater all day long while the sun was out. So um, it wasn't really until the Jacobean time in, um, in the West that we had theater moving indoors. It was more, it was sooner for Asian theaters. They were doing a lot of dinner theater in emperor's halls and banquet rooms. Um, but in the West with Shakespeare's day, once we had that Jacobean theater and we could have theater inside is when we started all these cool lighting techniques. Um, first of course with candles or live flames and then moving through the different technology of light bulbs. So when we talk about lighting, it's important to remember the Stanislavski quote, great art conceals art. So there's a good chance if you are watching that live theater production, or sorry, I wish it were live in the air of COVID, it's not. Uh, if you're watching that theater production and you don't notice anything about the lighting, it's because they're doing their job right? <laughs> if you're watching a musical like Hamilton, and they may have some fun lighting effects, but there's never a problem, you may take for granted that spot operator because they're always doing their job, right? Um, it's as soon as somebody misses a cue at the light board that everybody who's in theater turns, turns around and look at the light board. So it's one of those things that when things are going right, you may not even notice it right it may add to the overall beauty of the story it may add to the mood but you may not even mentally understand that there's a problem until for example we ran out of time and didn't get all the wrinkles out of the psych and it's creating shadows right then then you're like oh wait that lighting is messed up but a really good lighting practitioner can make it look so easy so lighting has historically made the theater a dangerous place to be because of live flames, because of, you know, if you've ever heard somebody say that they're standing in the limelight, uh, you know, machines like this that used um, uh, live flame along with sometimes um, chemicals <laughs> like lime, uh, it, it can be dangerous, right? So we have that uh, around the time that um, musicals came to prominence, operettas in Europe, and then, of course, the traditional American musical in the U.S., this limelight technology was 
a big element of it was just a direct spotlight from the top of the theater coming down on the performer below. And so it's still to this day, if you look at musicals, standing in the spotlight is a common motif because at the time that musicals were created, uh, we had that sort of silhouette happening. So, um, of course, lots of London theaters burned down. Shakespeare's theater burned down when Henry uh, the Eighth, the cannon went off and the thatched roof caught fire and everyone evacuated thankfully but um, lots and lots of especially um, in the 1800s theaters burning down as lighting equipment uh, gas lighting was becoming popular especially um so what's the purpose of lighting number one focus is visibility if you can't see the actors on stage and the action of the play, then your your lighting is unsuccessful. And now this can be challenging when you have limited instrumentation like we have in Oath Hall. We only have so many lighting instruments to create cool effects to light the amount of stage that we have. We're in an old building, so we only have so many lighting instruments. So we can only do so much because we don't have the instrumentation or the tools to create lots of fun effects right? We have limited um, instrumentation. So this is a picture of Wicked. You can see Glenda. Uh, let them be glad. She's coming in in her bubble dress um, in a bubble because she's the, um, the good witch, uh, as you may know if you're familiar with Wicked. Now, the lighting designer has created a beautiful psych backdrop there. That's not the set. That's actually the lighting. Um, that psych is lit in different colors by the lighting designer. You can see some fun mood lighting down here in the chorus. But are the chorus the main focus of the story? No, Glenda the Good is. And so we've got that spotlight operating on her. Now, If you watch a lot of HGTV, you know that a lot of rooms if you're designing um, interior design for a room it's nice to have a focal point it's nice to have a centerpiece for your room right and that same sort of principles are going to carry over into lighting you want to create a hot spot visually to direct people's eyes if you can and then um, you know create background. So we've got focus here and then she can see. All right now we can't see the facial expressions of the people down here, but just like we'll talk about directing, you don't necessarily have to see every character's reaction. We're mainly looking for her reactions, right? Especially during her solo song. So lighting helps set the mood. Bom chicka wow wow, right? Uh, if you've ever as a woman gone into a dressing room to try on clothes, you know that uh, marketers definitely know this. They're going to have the most flattering light in those high-end dressing rooms. They're going to um, try to make you feel pretty with the lighting in the dressing room to try to get your money. But, um, of course, this is Glass Menagerie. We see this mood that set the romantic mood through the candlelight. That's a really important um moment in the script where Laura is sharing her menagerie with the male suitor. So it can set a mood, whether it's a fantasy mood of jollity and pinks, or a romance mood of warm lighting, or a dangerous mood, right? If we look at horror plays like Hitchcock, we see strong shadows, we see um, angles that are very um, you know, shadows that are thrown up onto the wall. If you've ever seen Phantom of the Opera, you get some wonderful mood lighting done through shadow work. So part of the light's story is to tell a certain time of day. And this is something, if you're not observant, you may not even think about. It's one of the most challenging elements for lighting a uh, movie, right? So if you've ever worked on a movie set, you know, uh, if you're on the crew, you may have to get there at four in the morning. Why? Because the light will be right at such a certain time and you have to get all the extras costumed. You have to get all the equipment set up before that magic hour of light that you need. So setting the time of day through the lighting, right? If you have a play that's done in real time and it has windows, then you have to sort of watch that time progress through the lighting effects, 
right? Lighting can also convey a place. It can help set you in time and place through the lighting, right? So we can see this is an indoor scene through the light coming through the window. If it's meant to be an outdoor scene, it's fine to have those blues and yellow colors coming from the top as would the sky reflect. So a light plot is what a master electrician uses to chart out his instruments. So these are battens here. And every single one of these lighting instruments has a certain wattage. So you have to do the math to make sure you don't um, blow any circuits, right? I did Anything Goes at Franklin County High School way back in the day in the old theater that's now TCAT. Um, and the lighting, the electricity in that was so bad that we actually... Uh, had to stop in the middle of anything goes because we had um, to go flip the circuit, right? <laughs> to go flip the breaker and turn all the lights back on. Uh, so you have to work within the parameters of what your building can do. You know, Ofall 1982, 1983, sorry. So that wiring is old. We have to be careful about overloading any given uh, lighting circuit. Just like if you have ever tried to plug in your hair dryer and your curling iron at the same time in an old house you're gonna you're gonna overdo it or run the microwave at the same time as the toaster oven in an old house you're gonna uh, override that system you gotta be careful about that but it gets you can see it gets very complicated it's, but if you've worked in the same theater for a long time you kind of get the eye of it and you don't have to do plots as often but if you're in a Turing production you better do a plot so you can see up here the battens with the individual lighting instruments on it. This was a picture from The Wiz again, um, and that's Zan, one of my favorite students. He was the stage manager. So you can see it was a rock star show, so we had a lot of fun colors through gels. Gelatin is this film that we put over the lighting instrument to change the color of it. Now this film will burn up over time because uh, the heat will get through the uh, film and eat through that gel. But adding color, especially to a rock and roll production like The Wiz, was a really fun choice. Now you have to be careful if you pick these darker colors, it's going to be a darker, um, you can harm your visibility. So it's a trade-off. When we get into these LED instruments, you don't have to have gels because they can automatically switch colors. So if you're at um, a rock concert at a place like Bridgestone and you look up and see a lighting instrument with lots of tiny little bulbs on the instrument, that's an LED instrument. It doesn't require a gel. It automatically changes colors. And my first LED instruments, I was so excited because you can change the mood at the blink of an eye. You just press that button, pick the color out of the infinite colors you have listed in the software, and man is it fun compared to cutting out individual pieces of film and putting on the frame on the lighting instrument and then putting that, sliding that gel into that frame. Um, those LED instruments are fantastic, and if you ever want to start a conversation with a high school theater teacher and make them drool, talk to them about gelling because we all want these LED lights. So this is um, an ERS. It, it can shoot from really long distances. If you look at the back of a theater and see these long skinny instruments, um, I can take just four of these and really, they have enough power and light. Um, they're going to fill the whole stage with light. It's really exciting. They get very, very hot. If you look at a Fresnel, that's the type of lens here with all these grooves in it. These are really old-fashioned lenses. So if you see an instrument with this Fresnel on there, you're probably looking at a really old-fashioned. Park hands are what you're going to see most often if you're at Bonnaroo and you're at a second stage. They're probably going to just have park hands, a tree of park hands. Uh, it's basically just a tin can uh, with a light bulb inside of it pointed in the general direction of the stage. They're the cheapest and easiest, the most lightweight in for touring productions or outdoor productions. So you can see these instruments hang on battens above the stage. They can be flown in and out. So uh, I say above the stage, of course, a lot of them are above the audience members as well out in the house. You can see as well. I wish we could go walk around Oath and I could show you all the lighting instruments. You could see them up close and personal. 
Dang you, Corona. So I would be amiss if we got through talking about all of technical theater and we didn't mention cueing. So the difference between a good theater practitioner and the technical side, or really in the performing side as well, is cues, the timing of things. Nothing is worse than going to a production and it having a really slow transition from one location to another. And you have to wait forever for the set to change or the props to come out, right? Keeping those cues going keeps the audience engaged. Keeping the cues and timing correct is what often feels like a well-rehearsed play versus a poorly rehearsed play. A lot of what we're doing in rehearsal leading up to a production is working on cueing and timing, right? Just as much as actors do, technicians are working as well to say, okay, should I have a five second fade into this next song or should we do a 10 second fade into this next song, right? Is it a slower moment in the script or a faster moment? So good technicians, good soundboard operators, lightboard operators, stage managers, um, they're all interested in these pre-arranged signals called cues. So a cue could be an actor's line saying, um, saying a certain phrase, or it could be the end of a song, it could be that pre-arranged signal. Like I said, it can be a word in the speech. It can be a piece of business, right? Man shoots woman. That's your cue to turn the lights off, right? Um, any action that is creating the transition, those are what we'll talk about as cues, right? Sometimes you have a live orchestra, and that's a really fun thing. And this conductor here, of course, she's also doubling as the pianist. This is when we did Wiz. This conductor is all concerned about cueing. Right? She's giving the second pianist his cue. She, he, she's giving the soloist her cue as to when to come in on the song. She is the conductor is all about cueing. So sound design, of all the things that we've talked about today, sound design is the thing I am least confident in. I just don't have an ear for it the same way that other people do. I can mix levels pretty well, especially if we're talking about like singers. Um, but uh, my mom is a music teacher, uh, was a music teacher. And so it really probably hurts her heart to hear me talk, confess my ignorance when it comes to sound. Um but it's a relatively new part. You know, there weren't sound designers in uh, Elizabethan England. Shakespeare didn't have uh, sound designers for his plays. It was really only with the, the new t newer technology of microphones and orchestras um, playing live or canned music, whether or not the music is recorded beforehand. That's when we really got into needing people to um, negotiate sound and work with microphones particularly. So um, altering the actor's voice or enhancing it, amplification of the music as well. If you have a small house like we do in Oaf Hall, you may not always want to mic the actors because sometimes it can be more work than it's worth. If a person has a nice, resonant, loud voice, no need to mic them. And then of course, sound effects. Some of them can, some of them pre-recorded, and others gaffers doing those sound effects live. Um, sound effects can be stylized or they can be realistic. When I did Alice in Wonderland, I had my brother-in-law who um, is a, you know, he's always been in bands and stuff and, and he was able to do some modification of the moment when Alice falls down the rabbit hole. And then again, when she wakes up, some cool sort of funky sound effects there. So... There are motivated sounds which are required by the script. So if a gun goes off in the script, we have to have a gunshot. That would be a motivated sound. Perhaps the oldest Foley activity we have is a thunder sheet because storms were also used for ambiance. In these classical plays, a storm was rolling in at the same time that Richard III was talking about um, you know, his villainous nature in the introduction uh, to Richard III. If we have galloping horses, uh, we might have wood blocks as a Monty Python fan, I have to include, or coconuts. <laughs> uh, but those sounds are required by the script. Those are motivated sounds. 
So body mics, you can see here, this is Babes in Toyland. She's got her body mic there. Um, and those are attached to the performer. These take an enormous amount of upkeep. You have to change the batteries after every show. Um, they use radio frequencies in our OF hall. And so um, unfortunately, being this close to the Air Force Base, we're always losing radio frequency. So it can be glitchy. If you go to see a production or you're paying to see a production at a community theater and the mics go out, please have grace for that. It is not perfect technology and it can be very frustrating. So, of course, we need sound reinforcement to amplify. So we need amps there. You can see the amps. You can amplify a musical instrument. More often, you need to amp the performer so that they can speak over, for example, the drummer who's always playing entirely too loud, right? So, so as opposed to those other kinds of sounds which are required by the script, there are also just noises that help us place us in time and space. So just like the lighting through the window can help place us in time and place, um, you know, the sounds of our environment, whether it be in a big city, you might hear a jackhammer. If you're in the country this time of year, you might hear crickets and the beautiful singing of crickets. So the noise helps set you in a time and place, particularly if you don't have a lot of scenery or in the case of Hamilton, you have a unit set. So you're trying to take people different places through the sound effects, through the ambiance and the lighting, even though there's only one backdrop for everything, right? So environmental sound can really enhance the experience. All right, well, that was a really fast-paced lecture. I hope you were able to catch everything. So now you're going to go away, and you're going to take either The Sound of Music or Hamilton, that character that you picked before, and create a new costume for them that has to be different from the costume that you watched in the movie right? And it can be subtly different or it can be way different. Like I said, it can incorporate fashionable items from the current day. It could be a strong, bold color choice that is different from what your, um, what your uh, original designer did. But you'll just want to go and fill out that worksheet about what those choices mean to you. You know, maybe you're going to put Eliza in a bright red at the end of the show because you say she's really come into her power, right? So that would be an example of um, your new way of looking at this character and expressing that through the costume. So as always, thank you for listening.